My physical body's here, but I'm somewhere else right now. I don't know how it is in there, but uh, when you're up here. Um, so I'm gonna try to speak to you today, even though I don't know if I, I I'm not responsible for my words, okay? Um, so God has been speaking to me lately, especially this month, um, this, this last week. Um, the moment we are right now calendar-wise is between the resurrection of Christ and his ascension and then the fall of the Holy Spirit, right? So when the Holy Spirit came after 50 days, roughly after the crucifixion, that's, uh, that's Pentecost. And we have a conference and past the Pentecost weekend. So this is really, really important. This is really holy. We're in a moment right now um, in between the crucifixion and when Jesus ascended to heaven. And God's been speaking to me about that. He's, he's, he's been telling me, hey, look at, look at what Jesus did after the cross, but while he was here as a human walking amongst us. Because uh, when he did that, after the cross, everybody who, who saw him was seeing a resurrected Christ, was seeing God himself. Um, and that's what we see, because we were born after that. So every, everything he said after the cross, he was speaking to people who are sort of like us, who, who sort of already experienced the cross. Um, so we already know that he is who he says he was. And um, when, I was just looking at uh, what Jesus did um, after the resurrection. He could have just showed up for five minutes for two people and then said, hey, and then, then left, but he didn't. He stayed for 40 days. And why did he stay for 40 days? And what, what, was, what were his intentions when he came? Um, and I think there, there are two reasons why he stayed here for 40 days amongst us. Um, he had basically, I can categorize in two, two, two agendas. One of them is he needed to show himself, right? Um, if, he, if he showed up and he stayed for five minutes and he left, um, I don't know, I think he needed to show himself. Um, when he walked among us for 40 days, he was a display of everything he ever said to be true, right? Like he was proving himself to be true. He was who he said he was. He was the son of God. He resurrected. And so just human beings like us, we, we kind of need to see, right? Like when, when, when he goes to uh, Thomas and Thomas still doesn't believe until he sees, right? Humans are like that, right? So Jesus started his ministry 
with 12 followers that he picked, uh, fishermen from a village. By the time he was crucified, he had about 120 followers, so he multiplied that by 100, by, by 10, so. Um, but then it's been 2,000 years and 2.4 billion with the B people identify him as the Son of God and their Christ and their Savior, right? 2.4 billion. Um, I think those 40 days just showing up for to thousands of people and doing miracles alive, showing his body, I think was really, really important. Pastor Dennis touched on that part of Jesus' ministry on Resurrection Sunday. Um, so go back and watch that. Um, so showing himself victorious and a proof that he was who he said he was and therefore everything he ever said was true and we should take that and just run with it for the rest of our lives just follow whatever that man said right that was the first uh, part of him walking among us uh, for 40 days i believe the second part is he had an assignment for us because um we did, we never we never deserved what he did for us um he, he was perfect, he had no sin, and, and us sinners, we put him on that cross. We never deserved it, he did it anyway. He made us um, deserve, he made us worthy of it by, by doing it, um, but he did it, and we were so lucky to actually experience that. We didn't deserve it, but he did it anyway. But with that, he asks something in return. He asked something of us, and that's what I wanted to talk about. Because um, uh, in Matthew 28, 18, um, can you put that verse up? Matthew 28, 18. Um, I can't read that from the back, folks. There we go. So this is Jesus after the, the crucifixion. He gathers all the disciples. Um, in Galilee, and he says this, and I think this is really, really wonderful. He says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So all authority, all authority from heaven, meaning I am who I say I am. I'm speaking with the authority of heaven on this earth. And he says, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teach them to observe all that I have commanded you, all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always at the end of the age. Can you go back to verse 19 for me and keep that on the screen for a little bit? Um, go to all nations, right? Uh, if you read this, um, this is not in just the Gospel of Matthew, but if you read this um, in in Mark, he says, uh, go preach to all creatures, all creatures, right? Here Matthew says, uh, make disciples of all nations. Now, um, we, we live in sort of a individualistic word, world. Um, people are, so when you read this, you might go, okay, how do I do this, right? Like he asked one thing of me, how do I go there and how do I do this? How do I go to all nations and I speak the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? How do I do this? Oh, you probably can't by yourself. Um, the, you, you can evangelize a little bit. Um, there's something you can do. Um, I, I'm, I work here, I work for Malik Media. I'm responsible for making sure that the content that we put out is, 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 is excellent. In fact, that's one of our cult, cultural pillars. Excellence is a mindset. Um, my job is to make sure we're doing this excellently. And one of the aspects of this is giving a good, clean stream to our online family, right? So I'm gonna share something with you that I, it's really, really precious for me and I hope it blesses you because it blesses me every single week. So the first thing I do when I get here is I rewatch this service. So my, my week starts, my work week starts by rewatching this and making sure this was as good as it could be and how could we make it better, right? So the, one of the first things I do every week, I'm gonna share that with you. Um, I brought a present here with me. Um, I, we stream in three platforms online and um, we get reports out of those streams. I can look at reports of how many people are watching, how long they watched it. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that, one of the ways I can filter this is by geography. 
So I can get a report of every single country or even city that's been watching our stream, right? So this week, I decided to print that out and share that with you. So these are the reports of all the countries that have watched our service only in the last few weeks. So this is April only, okay? Um, I'm going to read every single country that tuned into our stream. Um, it's going to be a while, so brace yourself. So you, wanna, you might want to sit because it's a lot, okay? All right. Canada, United States, Germany, Jamaica, South Africa, Kenya, Switzerland, Cyprus, Australia, Malaysia, Nigeria, New Zealand, Sweden, Italy, Turkey, Pakistan, Philippines, Portugal, Netherlands, Russia, Singapore, Paraguay, Japan, Uganda, Taiwan, India, Ireland, Hungary, Honduras, Hong Kong, United Kingdom, France, Finland, Poland, unknown you know what unknown means it means they don't know where they watch from and this is really precious to me because it could be most likely it's people from countries where christianity is a, it's, it's against the law so they can't really freely watch this but if, if they find a, a back channel to watch this they can watch too so the 176 unknown countries are actually really quite precious to me as well let's keep going korea czech republic that's right Republic of Korea, Czech Republic, Brazil, that's where I'm from. It might be my mom, I don't know. <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to try not to repeat countries. A lot of countries showed up in all of the lists. I, I printed reports from all of our streaming services, but here we go. Sweden, and I have I mentioned Sweden, Belgium, Cameroon, one more African nation, Cameroon, Panama, Indonesia, Namibia, Bangladesh, Lebanon, Ghana. Um, some cities here, we actually, it's, it's funny, some of them give me by cities, right? Um, I, there's a few cities from Nigeria, I only knew Lagos, Lagos is pretty big, but Aba, Nigeria, Akure, Nigeria, Ugbeb, Nigeria, names I can't even mention, they, I can't even say them. Uh, Gambia, the Gambia, anyway, um, I don't know about you, I don't know, maybe it's just me. When I read this, I, I cry weekly. Does that sound to you like going to all nations and preach the gospel? No, here's the thing. By ourselves, we can do only so much. Together, we're unstoppable though. We're in, if we come together and we do this as one body, we're completely unstoppable. Now, um, you know, God bless Pastor Faisal. So he, he was called by God to be an apostle, and he started this whole thing. Um, so we commend him for it, having the vision to do this. Because when, you know, when you read, when you read Matthew and you go preach to all nations, he's like, all right, I'll do it, because he's an apostle, right? But we all built this thing together every single week. Every single week when we come here, we build this house together. So think of your, your tithes and offerings as sort of like a brick like a spiritual brick that God gives you every single week, right? In the natural, it's just a financial transaction that you're gonna do, your money leaves your account and that's it. In the natural, that's all it is. In the spiritual though, it's like a brick that God gave you and you, you can choose to use it or not this week. If you don't, it's gone. But if you choose to do that, you have your unique little brick that, that God gave you uniquely, whoever you are spiritually, that's what you're bringing to the table. And you can use that one brick for absolutely nothing by yourself. Or we can all bring them all together and build this one house. And the more bricks we have, the bigger the house. And the bigger the house, the more the, the more that list is gonna grow. And we're gonna go to all nations and bless all creatures with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because you see, that's how the gospel of Matthew ends. Um, you know, describe, you know, Jesus says that and then he ascends right after. That's the last thing like that. The gospel of Matthew ends like that. The gospel of Mark ends like that. Um, that's, that's the last thing Jesus is like, all right, you do it. You take my testimony to the nations. I'll be with you till the rest of time while you do it. And then I'm going to come back after you do that. So I think we focus too much on waiting for him to come back. But have we done our, our end of the bargain? Are we... Are we are we, have we fulfilled the great commission that Jesus gave us? And so when we bring our tithes and offerings, that's what we're doing. We're bringing our little spiritual brick to build this house, 
build it bigger, build it stronger. Um, this is not just any house, it's, it's a special house where miracles can happen, people get healed. When we build this house, we're being part of the healing of this world. Jesus Christ, God himself invited you to be part of the healing of this world. And there's absolutely nothing more important for you to do today. So sometimes if you feel that your tithes and offerings, they're just a financial transaction, it's all about money. It is about money in the natural, but in the spirit, you're doing so much more. You're fulfilling prophecy when you do that. You're fulfilling Jesus's um, great commission to us. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we bring to you our tithes and offerings today. And we do it as, uh, as spiritual bricks. And we do as you commanded, as a declaration, a public declaration that we say yes to the great commission to take your gospel, to go to the nations and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. And we do that in the name of the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, amen. Listen, that list in June, when I look at that on my computer, um, after the conference, it's gonna be a lot bigger. Um, for some reason, conferences, just, just, we, we just got more outreach. It, it's a beautiful thing. So you know what? This month of May, expect something big to happen because, um, you know, when, when we celebrate Pentecost on this, it, it, it's just gonna be the end of something that is already happening right now. So into that conference, so when I show up here after the conference, that list is three times that big. And, and we, we talk to all countries and all nations of the earth, okay? So if you're here, there are envelopes in front of you. You can give, um, uh, the ushers are gonna uh, bring baskets out. Um, you can also give on your phone or your computer. We're gonna sing a song about how good God is because he is good to us. We never deserved it, but he did it anyway. Um, so let's give together, family. I am blessed, I am called, I 
We're so glad you're here. Before we continue, there's a few things we want you to know. Limitless Youth, ages 13 to 17, are meeting this Sunday. Come hang out after the service from 12.30 to 3 p.m. Food and drinks will be provided. Prayer makes things possible. Join us in person on Tuesday, May 10th for a corporate prayer meeting at 7 p.m. If you can't attend in person, register for a private Zoom link at covenantoflife.org slash events. Register now for the first annual Holy Spirit Summit, the weekend of Pentecost on June 3rd to the 5th. This summit will be like no other conference we've had. We are sensing that the Holy Spirit will move in a powerful and unusual way. Whether attending in person or virtually, register today at covenantoflife.org slash events. Join us for pre-service prayer every Sunday at 9 a.m. at the Langley campus. If you're a part of the online campus or Quinell, we invite you to join via Zoom. Register at covenantoflife.org slash events. If this is your first time visiting CLM, we have an exclusive gift for you. For in-person guests, please fill out one of our guest cards located in the seat pocket in front of you and give it to one of our campus ushers. At the end of service, please head over to the guest lounge and one of our team members will give you an exclusive gift. For our online guests, fill out a guest card at covenantoflife.org guest. Looking for a new home? If you're watching from one of our streaming platforms, you can virtually join the CLM family by registering at covenantoflife.org newmember. new member. 
If you're in-house and feeling a tug on your heart to make CLM your home, simply raise your hand and an usher will come by and give you a new member form. Kids World Now has an in-person and virtual classroom. To access our virtual classroom, go to covenantoflife.org slash kidsworld. And if you're here in person, our Kids World classroom is located upstairs. At this point, we kindly ask that you put your phone to silent, and if at any point you need to use the washroom, they're located in the back right corner of the studio. That's what's happening at CLM. We're so glad you could join us today. Let's have a great service. Sunday. We're so excited with all these nations and countries and peoples around the world that are tuned in, not only live, but later on, many of them watch it on demand around the world as well. Isn't that awesome? Are you thankful? Let's give God a hand once again for what He's doing in our midst to touch people's lives. Uh, T, I must say, I am so grateful for what you shared today. It really, really touched us. I was so moved by what you shared. Was that just amazing? how the Spirit of God was flowing on him. Uh, I'm so grateful. I, you know, I remember when T first came here. And uh, he came and he was checking things out, looking at our sound, because he originally came as an audio engineer. And he was like, you know, whatever these people do in this church thing, if, it's, if, if I have any problems with it, I'm leaving immediately. Because he came from a, you know, a Catholic background and he had been away uh, from church in general. As a young boy, he always loved God. But, you know, he, he just didn't feel that, you know, there was a real expression of Jesus per se is the way he interpreted it at that time. But uh, here he is, and here he is ministering and sharing thoughts from God's heart with us. Were you touched by what he shared? I was really touched by what he shared. Thank you, T, uh, for that. Also want to thank Pastor Andy and our worship ministry team. Can we just thank God for them? Appreciate you taking the time to lead us into a place of worship. It's always an honor and a privilege. And so today we're really excited. Once again, we have Liz from Oregon. God bless you. Uh, we have uh, Pastors Bruce and Linda from Cornell as well. We just want to say we love you guys. Pastors Vic and Diana and Cornell and the entire team there in Cornell and our campus in Cornell. We just want to say we love you. We're so honored to see what the Holy Spirit is doing uh, in your midst over there. And encourage you to be part of, in person, uh, this conference, the Holy Spirit Summit that's happening on Pentecost weekend, please come and join us. Get down here on a train, an automobile. Uh, get down here on, well, I don't know if there's a train from Cornell. But just get down here. You're going to have an awesome time. It's going to be incredible. We're so excited about that as well. Love our online family here on the website that are tuned in and on YouTube and on uh, social media platforms like Facebook. God bless you. We're so glad that you're with us. It's awesome here. I'm so excited about today. Uh, I know we've been in the middle of a series called Your Words Matter. And uh, today, Beverly Watkins is going to minister to us, and she's going to bring us uh, a really important message. In fact, I am so excited about today. You know, uh, last night, actually, before I went to bed, we, we finished praying, and uh, I, I felt the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, son, people need to get excited with expectation every week when they come into my house. Because Sunday, something good's going to happen to you. And I'm telling you, you got to have that expectation when you come into the house. You're not like, oh, maybe I should go to church this morning. No, something good is going to happen to you. you got to have expectation. You're going to learn. You're going to grow. You might receive revelation. You might receive a breakthrough. You might receive answer to prayer. you receive insight. Wisdom will come. Blessing will come. How many are excited and expectant to receive from heaven because we've come in the house of God? And so I immediately was like, I can't wait to show up Sunday morning. <laughs> Hello. Because there's been some Sunday mornings I wasn't excited about showing up, to be honest with you. But I was excited about showing up today. Because I'm like, God, you're going to do something. And I'm telling you, it's already been a blessing. So let me tell you about Bev as she gets ready uh, to minister to us. We have a lot going on today. It's Family Sunday. Yes, we are going to receive communion. Yes, we're going to receive you into the family, into the house of God. If you desire to be part of the house today, we're going to get time to pray for you. But let me tell you about Bev. Number one, Bev is part of the CLM family, Bev and Robin and their family. Just an incredible couple, incredible family. I deeply and highly value and respect them. And so excited about them being part of the house. 
Bev is also uh, an elder here at CLM. We, our eldership team is awesome. We love them. We're thankful for them. She's also part of the apostolic team that we have here at CLM and the Plumline Leadership Network. And it's such an honor to be, you know, uh, co-laboring with her in the Holy Spirit. And she is no doubt a genuine, I say this carefully, genuine prophet and teacher. And uh, I've run into a lot of non-prophets in my life. But it's nice to have real prophets too, amen, because we appreciate that. And so Beverly is a real prophet and teacher. She loves the Word. She loves God. She loves people. And she loves you as well. And uh, so does Robin as well. What an amazing family they are. So uh, let's welcome Beverly Watkins. Let's give, him, uh, give her a warm CLM welcome. Come on, let's, we can do better than that. Beverly, we're so excited for you to join us. There you are. So excited to have you here. Well, CLM family, it's so awesome to be with you again. And of course, everybody else who's joining us online. Uh, wasn't that so cool? All those nations around the world. I have to say, T, I just echo what Pastor just said. Like, I, I felt like I could cry just thinking, oh, wow, Lord, look what you are doing. It's just so incredible. So it's a real privilege for me to be with you again today. Of course, I always want to be there in person, but at least we get together together, even if it is digitally uh, today. So I'm going to just kind of dive right in because I feel like this message is burning up on the inside of me. Uh, you know, the Lord's been speaking to me uh, about this. And just as I've been praying and together with Pastor, we've been praying. Uh, we just really feel that, you know, there is something that the Lord wants to bring out. And as you know, we've been in the series, Your Words Matter. And hasn't it, it's been really so good. The pastors have done an excellent job of really bringing to our attention how important our words are. I mean, I, be, I know, well, I'm trusting that by now, we have realized that the words that we speak, what comes out of our mouths is, can be really creative or it can be really, really destructive. You know, as Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And we've been learning that as we've been going through this very important series that we've been in. But we not only have we learned that life and death are in the power of the tongue, but we've also learned that what comes out of our mouths is very much connected to what is in our heart. Remember that the Bible tells us that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So what, what we, the words that come out of here, they actually originate in here, in our hearts. Let's quickly look at Matthew 12, 34 and 35, where uh, the scripture just expounds this to us. It says, and this is Jesus speaking actually to the Pharisees. He says, brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. So therefore, what you treasure in your heart is what's going to actually come out of your mouth. Whether it's good or bad, what you treasure, what you hold close in your heart is going to come out of your mouth. And we've been learning all about this. And that's why the pastors have been teaching us why it's so important to watch what we say. So we're connecting and understanding that our words are connected to our heart. So if we're going to watch our words, guess what? We need to have a look at our heart. And that's why as we kind of step into this a little bit more this week, I entitled this message, The Heart of the Matter. Because we're going to look at our hearts and how our hearts are involved in the, what comes out of our mouths and we're going to begin to look at some of the things in our hearts uh, that could be really problematic for us and cause a lot of death to come out of our mouths. Because I don't know about you, but I want life coming out of my mouth and not death. Amen. So if we're ready to dive in here, we're going to be starting off in James chapter 3. 
Now, in verses 1 to 12 of James chapter 3, I'm not going to read them because we've mentioned them several times in this series. But James is has written this letter to believers that are, you know, scattered in different places, but he's writing to the church and he's writing to help them to understand some things so that they can grow up in the Lord. And we want to be growing up in the Lord. Uh, and so this is part of the reason why we're looking at our words matter. So in those first 12 verses, James is talking about the tongue. And he's talking about, you know, the small little member that has such incredible power, you know, can do so much damage if it's actually left unrestrained. And I love the graphic pictures that James gives us. You know, he says the tongue can be like a little spark that sets fire and burns down a whole forest. I mean, just think, just imagine that picture right now. Think of a huge forest. And I know you have beautiful forests there in British Columbia, but think of a beautiful forest. One little spark, like one little word could burn the whole thing down. That's real destruction. And he says as well, he says, and this fire that, that our words can begin, it says actually that fire can burn generationally. There are things that we say that not only can burn down the whole forest, but they can start a fire that won't go out when you die, but it actually will continue to burn after you're gone into the, in the generations to come. So it has lasting effect what comes out of our mouths. This is what James is saying. He's trying to impress on us just how important it is that we recognize the power of our words and the tongue that speaks it. And a very interesting thing he says in these first verses, he says, you know, the tongue is so set amongst our members that it can defile the whole body or corrupt the whole body. So we've been learning that what comes out of your mouth, it can mess up your whole life. It can make you sick. It can make you sick emotionally or physically, and it can actually cause real problems in your life. But biblical scholars also say that, that that piece of scripture says that the tongue is so set among the body of Christ that our words can even bring defilement and corruption to the body of Christ. That means that our words, the things that we speak, can affect the whole church, can affect our community, can have an effect on, on the body that we are a part of. Just think about that. What you say doesn't just affect you, it affects everybody. And so James is drawing our attention to this and he's saying, think, I want you to get the picture. I want you to get how important it is because he says, no man has tamed the tongue. He said, it's unruly. It's a world of evil. It hasn't been tamed. But he says, those that are mature have been able to bridle their tongue. And you know, I know the word bridle is related to horses, but I did go and look up, you know, how a bridle works. And what it actually is, is when you have a horse that you want to tame and train and you want the horse to kind of go where you want it to go and not just run off and do its own thing, you would put what they call a bit in the horse's mouth. So it's a little thing that goes in its mouth, in its tongue, connected to a bridle that is some ropes that go around its head, which is connected to reins. And the person that sits on the horse holds the reins. And by pulling on the reins, you put pressure on what's in the mouth of the horse. And it trains that horse to go in the direction that you want it to go. And so James is saying to us, because of how dangerous our tongue can be, how dangerous our words can be, we need to learn to bridle our tongue. We need to learn uh, how to bring it under control, to restrain it so that our tongue speaks words that actually will bring life and not death. But if our tongue is connected to our heart, then guess what? What's in your heart is what's controlling what's coming out of your mouth. So we have to ask the question, what is the Lord of your heart? Who's sitting on the throne in your heart, holding the reins of your mouth, of your tongue? Is your, who's, who is sitting on the throne? Is it God? Is it Jesus sitting on the throne of your heart? And he's the one who's pulling the reins through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's saying, oh, that's not a good thing to say right now. Ooh, hold your tongue over here. This is where you can speak life into a situation. So is Jesus holding the reins in our heart? Or is something else holding the reins? Is, this, is it me, myself? 
I want to say what I want to say. I want to, you know, speak my mind. I want to be authentic and just let out everything that's inside of me. Then I'm holding the reins and I'm deciding what comes out of my mouth. And so James here is drawing our attention to this because he's saying we need to look at this because as believers, if we've given our hearts to Jesus, if we are born again, in theory, it's Jesus who's sitting on the throne of our heart. In theory, we're submitting our will to him all the time. Not so? But, you, but, but yet sometimes in our life, one moment we're praising God and the next moment we're cursing our brothers and sisters is what James is saying. You, there's, there's sweet water and bitter water coming out of the same mouth. And that means that in our hearts, there's this mixture going on. There's this part of us that's praising God. And then there's another part that's cursing, that's, that's saying things that don't line up with scripture, that's actually bringing destruction and evil. And James is kind of bringing this to the attention of believers because he's saying this should not be so. This is a problem that is it's creating big problems for us in the body of Christ. And so he's going to go further into this now as we continue in James chapter 3. We're going to pick it up in verse 13 because James is now going to address this issue in our heart that is causing our words to be sometimes bitter and sometimes sweet. Sometimes we're speaking life and sometimes we're bringing death and we have to recognize this. So let's go to James chapter 3 verse 13 and I want to have a look at this in the Passion Translation. Now, guys, I'm going to be reading quite a bit of scripture here because the scripture really just opens this up for us. And James is getting right to the point. So let's begin. James chapter 3 and verse 13. It says, if you consider yourself to be wise and one who understands the ways of God, advertise it with a beautiful, fruitful life guided by wisdom's gentleness. Never brag or boast about what you've done and you'll prove that you're truly wise. Now, let's just hold on there a moment. So James is saying, if you are wise and if there's a place of maturity about you, you're going to you're going to live a life. And in some translations, it says your conversation and your manner of life is going to be with humility. You're not going to boast a lot. You're not going to brag all the time about what you've done. You're not. If you truly are going to be wise, you don't go around having to tell everybody how wonderful you are, what breakthroughs you've had, the latest revelation you've had from God. You don't need to always be talking about, well, I did this and I did that and I'm so wonderful. And did I tell you about when I did this? And, and if it's not you, it's like, well, my children are this and my husband is this and everything about me is just bigger and better than everybody else. He's saying a wise person doesn't do that. And because James is trying to show us now, he said, this is what a wise person looks like. So let's read on. It says, but if there is bitter jealousy or competition hiding in your heart, then don't deny it and try to compensate for it by boasting and being phony. For well, that has nothing to do with God's heavenly wisdom, but can best be described as the wisdom of this world, both selfish and devilish. My, my, my. Okay. So wherever jealousy and selfishness are uncovered, you will also find many troubles and every kind of meanness. Let's just hold on there because James is using some really, really strong language now because he's trying to show us true wisdom and maturity, what it looks like as opposed to something that looks like human wisdom or even demonic wisdom. Because he's saying to us here, when we get into a place where we are always talking about ourselves, where we are bragging about what we've done, where the topic of conversation is always me and, and, and the good things about me or my life, or it's just always centered on me, he's saying, actually, what, what is happening here is that there is jealousy, bitter jealousy and competition in your heart. Now you're going, what? If I just talk about myself, are you telling me there's bitter jealousy in my heart? Well, the thing is, he's saying that we've ended in a place where that could be. 
He says, because you don't, he should not try and deny it and compensate for it by boasting and being phony. Now, I'm going to explain in a little while about how this comes to be in our heart. But James is pointing something out. You can listen to how a person speaks and it will begin to uncover what is in their hearts. Because if a person is always boasting about their own works, what they can do, how they can do something better, how they've always seen it better, how they're better at some things, they're always talking about themselves. I mean, think about it. We've all got, we all know at least one person. You know, when, you, when you're when you around that person, you know, you whether you meet them for coffee, you're on a call with them, they're just going to talk about themselves. You're going to call them and they're going to tell you, well, I've been doing this and this. And then I did that. And then, do you know, my child did this. And it was so incredible. And you can't believe that what they did. And then this and then this. And then the Lord told me this. And, and they just talk about themselves. If they take a moment to take a breath, it's quite something. They very often, they, and if, or if they do say, well, how are you? You might even start talking and then they just talk over you because it's all about them. And James is saying that when we're told that these things can be in our hearts, often without us really understanding or knowing that they are there. But he is saying that we need to become aware of it. We need to be able to identify where there is bitter jealousy, where there is competition in our hearts. And one of the ways is we looking at what's coming out of our mouth. Because here's the thing, he says, when we begin to behave like this, this is not the wisdom of God. So sometimes when a person feels like they're mature, they feel it's their job to tell everybody how wonderful they are all the time. They feel it's their job to have the answer for everything all the time, to have a revelation for everything, to know the answer to every question on earth, because they sense or feel perhaps that that's the wisdom of God. But James is telling us here, no, that is earthly wisdom or or, or human wisdom at best. And at worst, it's demonic wisdom. So James is saying to us, this is not good. We don't want to have that bitter jealousy or competition in our heart because this is at best human wisdom and at worst, it's demonic. Because he goes on to say this, uh, in, he goes on to say in verse 16, So wherever jealousy and selfishness are uncovered, you will also find many troubles and every kind of meanness. You know, other translations put it like this. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Just think about that. Where there might be lurking in our hearts, jealousy or or envy or self-seeking or competition if that's there it's going to create confusion and every evil thing it's going to become a breeding place for the demonic for evil things and for confusion to reign and this is why it is important for us to begin to identify where does envy and jealousy and competition where do these things come from how do they lodge in our hearts because once they're lodged there, it seems we, we don't often know that they're there. And so we end up behaving and speaking in a way that actually is not helpful to the body of Christ, is not building up the body of Christ, but actually is infusing human wisdom and often bringing demonic wisdom to play, not only in our life, but actually in the community that we are a part of. James is making this distinction here at the end of chapter 3 because he says you must as the body of Christ begin to discern between what is pure wisdom and what is wisdom that comes from humans or demonic wisdom that is rooted in jealousy self-seeking and competition are you getting how serious this is okay and I believe that God is speaking to us about this because he's saying in this moment in time where we are right now in the body of Christ, this is something that is plaguing the body of Christ, okay? Jealousy, envy, self-seeking, you know, climbing on top of one another to get to get forward because everybody wants what they want. This is a problem and God is still speaking to his body today as he was when James wrote this letter to say we must identify and we must move away from operating like this. And you know, 
One of the reasons that this is so important is because the damage that this envy, jealousy, and self-seeking does. You know, I was I was listening to a pastor. His name is Bob Sorge, and I, I want to just read two quotes from him that really just you know, as I was listening to it, it stopped me in my tracks because I realized how serious it is for us to deal with this. So the first quote from Bob Sorge, if you guys could put it up for me on the screen, it says. Envy has the power to sabotage personal destiny in God because God cannot honor our efforts when they are subliminally driven by impure motives. As long as envy remains hidden in the crevices of our heart, our fruitfulness in Christ will inescapably be impeded. Just think for a moment. If envy is in our hearts, it's going to stop us moving into our destiny. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be hindered in moving forward in my destiny. And so envy, if envy's there, it's gonna stop us. So that's one of the reasons we wanna deal with, with envy in our own hearts. Number two, let's bring up the second quote, because he continued to say this. When we envy one another in the body of Christ, we release dynamics that actually bind the progress of the kingdom of God in our, uh, in our sphere or region. Envy has the power to obstruct the release of kingdom blessing, even in places where massive amounts of intercession for revival and visitation are ascending to God's throne. My, I, when I read that, I, I was like, oh my word. You know, we're believing for a move of God here in the house at CLM and Plumline. We're saying, God, we're crying out for a move of God. We're crying out to see the harvest come in. We're praying. We're seeking God. But guess what? Envy and jealousy can actually resist a move of God coming into a region or coming into, uh, into the kingdom. Just think about that, how serious it is envy, jealousy, self-seeking, they can derail destinies, but can also stop the move of God in a region. And this is why I believe that God is wanting to speak this word to us at this time. Because he's saying, we know, we sense that he wants to do something. We've even sensed as we are preparing for Pentecost weekend that God wants to move. God wants to presence himself with us in a greater way. And so, he said to us, prepare for Pentecost. And part of that preparation is we need to deal with our hearts. We need to begin to let him deal with any envy or jealousy or self-seeking that might be in our hearts that would cause us to move in human wisdom or in demonic wisdom. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to resist a move of God. I don't, I don't want anything in me to be resisting a move of God in our house, in the body of Christ. I don't want anything in me to be um, delaying or stopping my destiny or your destiny. So we want to deal with this. We want to take seriously what James is saying to us. So I hope you're with me. I hope you're still with me in this, okay? Because now we have to go on because James continues. It's so great, the Bible, you know, they, they show us everything and then they show us how it works and how to deal with it. So let's read on. Let's go to, let's go to James chapter four in verse one. We're in, still in the Passion Translation because James is now gonna begin to unpack how does this jealousy and envy actually even end up in our hearts so that we recognize it? Let's start, verse one. It says, what is the cause of your conflicts and quarrels with each other? Doesn't the battle begin inside of you as you fight to have your own way and fulfill your own desires? You jealously want what others have, so you begin to see yourself as better than others. You scheme with envy and harm others to selfishly obtain what you crave. That's why you quarrel and fight. And all the time, you don't obtain what you want because you won't ask God for it. And if you ask, you won't receive it because you're asking with corrupt motives, seeking only to fulfill your own selfish desires. Let's stop there for a moment. 
That's some harsh language, I think. But I'm so grateful that James laid this out for us because he is showing us this is how we end up with jealousy and envy in our heart. And he actually goes on to show us what the end point of that is. So let me take a moment just to quickly unpack for us what's going on. He's saying, where, where does all the, the strife come from? Where does the quarreling and fighting come from? He's saying, well, you know, all the divisions that come in the body of Christ, all the church splits that are going on, relationships breaking up, friendships falling apart, people being separated from one another. Where does this come from? And he's talking to the body of Christ now, remember? Because I know that, uh, listen, the church goes through more quarrels and strife and wars, you know, than almost anybody else, I would think. So he's speaking and he's saying, where does this stuff come from? Because he's saying, if we all love Jesus and we all serve Jesus, where are all these fights coming from? Where are all these divisions coming from? And he's saying, they start with us because we have desires that are corrupt, which means that in our hearts, there are places where we are choosing the desires of the world, the things that the world would offer to us. Instead of submitting ourselves to God, we're saying, oh, I want that. There's a desire that starts in our heart that we want for ourselves. Now, this is kind of bound up in the whole idea of don't covet your neighbor's things. Remember the Ten Commandments? The last commandment was, you know, don't cover your neighbor, covet your neighbor's wife or their house, you know, or their donkey or anything that belongs to them. Because what is it when we covet? It means we look around us and we see, ooh, I want that. Ooh, you know, Pastor Fassel, ooh, he has a really nice car. Mine's not so nice. Ooh, I want his car. It goes really fast, you know, or whatever it is. We look around at others who have things that we don't have, and we begin to want those things. And possibly those things are not for us, okay? But we, want, we start to want all these things. And when that thing begins to grow in our heart, what happens is all we can see is what we don't have. We don't even take note of what we do have. All we constantly feel is, I don't have what others have. And what happens is as that begins to brew in our hearts, we spend more and more time comparing ourselves to everybody else. We're looking at what this one has and that one has. And then we look at ourselves and we say, well, they've got that and I haven't got that. And this one's got that and I don't have that. And guys, this is not just on a, I want to say on a carnal level, cars and houses and nice new jackets and shoes and, you know, all of those types of things. Because I believe that on, on a level, we're aware of when we're, when we are coveting, you know, other people's stuff as it were. But where we sometimes fall down is we covet spiritual things. We look at one and say, well, well why, why do they prophesy with such power? I want to prophesy like that. I want that gift. How, why is this person chosen to lead a, a connect group and I'm not? Why is this one getting to preach on the stage and I'm not? And we begin to look at all the things or the opportunities that others are given and we go, why am I not being given that? Can you see that that wrong desire and then the covetousness leads us to this place of comparison. We're always comparing ourselves to other people. And what happens, and, and it's really stupid to do that. Actually, there's a scripture that says it's really stupid to compare yourself to one another because God has given to each one the grace that they need to do what they're called to do. Because what happens is when I compare myself to somebody else, what starts to grow in me is, Lord, why did you give that person that and you're not giving it to me? Is there something wrong with me? Don't you love me as much? Lord, why are you keeping these things from me? I'm we're looking at this person over there and Lord, you bless them so much and they're not as good a person as I am. Lord, I'm a nicer person. Lord, I tithe more frequently. I pray more than that person. So why are you blessing that person? Can you see what that begins to sound like? Now I know, you know, this is, this is, this is hard guys, because there's a part of us that wants to say, oh no, that's not me. I'm not like that at all. But I want to tell you, all of us are like this on some level. We have this conversation internally at some level because we get into comparison and competition. 
And this is not good for us because number one, it builds a resentment in our hearts towards God. A bitterness begins to grow. A seed of bitterness comes in our heart that wants to begin to grow. Because God, why do you bless them and not me? God, what's wrong with me? God, why, why, why? All of these things, this bitterness and resentment towards God. And at the same time, there's the comparison and the looking at the other people. And James tells us what we do is we then decide, well, I'm better than you. So I'm going to prove it to you. I, you you're getting so blessed. So I'm going to begin to prove to you and to God that I'm better so that I get the blessing. And so what do we do? Because in our hearts is envy, bitter, jealousy, and competition. What do we start to do? We begin to boast and we become phony because now we have to let the world know and we have to let God know that we are better than this person. That God, I'm worthy of you giving me these things. So I have to tell everybody all the time how good I am. What a fantastic revelation I had. When I did this and this happened, I did this and this happened. And so we begin to boast. What did James say? We begin to boast and we are phony and we deny the truth that actually there's jealousy in our hearts. And when we do this, we are now beginning to operate in human wisdom. Because it was human wisdom that said to you, well, I have to prove to God that I'm good enough. I have to prove to this person I'm better than them. That's human wisdom. And when we start doing those things, we're operating in human wisdom. So now we're not in the pure wisdom of God. We're not in the holy wisdom of God. We're in our own efforts. The challenge with this is that it can go another step further. Because as that seed of bitterness and resentment towards God begins to grow up in your heart, it creates a tree. Remember Hebrews 12, verse 15, it says that the seed will grow up into a tree and will defile many around you. So what happens is as that resentment grows, as you're competing and comparing and you're resentful towards God, that tree of bitterness grows in your heart. And what happens is now demons and demonic spirits come and rest in the trees of that spirit, of that tree of bitterness because we now begin to move from human wisdom and we move into demonic wisdom because now demons are beginning to speak into the situation and demons are beginning to release their wisdom to tell you now how do we take this to the next level to get what we want and this is what it, and this is what it says <clears throat> in that scripture in James chapter 2 and verse two, let's just go back to James, sorry, James chapter four and verse two. Let's just go back there a moment. It says, you jealously want what others have. So you begin to see yourself as better than others. Remember, now you begin to boast. You scheme with envy and harm others to selfishly obtain what you crave. That word where it says you scheme with envy and harm, that word harm can actually mean kill. And the word envy and kill in the Greek are very, very close together. So once you've got into the boasting phase and proving its phase, then the demons can begin to find place in that tree of bitterness and they begin to speak to you and say, well, now you need to make a plan. We need to scheme here. We need to come up with a, a plan for how you're going to do it because what that spirit begins to do is begins to say to you, the reason, Beverly, that you don't have what you want, the problem is this person or this group of people. They're your problem. They're taking your blessing. If they weren't there, you would be receiving the blessing. Everything that you that you desire, these things that you want, you would have them if this person wasn't here or those group of people. They're taking your place and your blessing. See, that's the lie of these spirits that come in. And they, they, there's the scheming with envy. And then it says, and then you move to harm others. Because the end result of envy and jealousy always goes to anger and murder. The end result of jealousy will always be murder. Because the spirit of jealousy and envy will want to kill the thing, the person, the group of people that is taking your blessing. And so that those spirits will stir you up to scare
scheme against them, to speak against them, to begin to say things, gossip, slander, all of these things, because you now are going to become the weapon that kills the object of your jealousy. Do you see how dangerous this is? Just think about this for a moment. And I know we're probably going, oh my, but that's not me. I, I, I don't kill anybody. I, that, I've, I've never been like that. Well, guys, I want you to remember that in Matthew, I believe Matthew chapter five, Jesus says, you know, you've heard it said that you shall not murder. But I say that even if there is anger in your heart, you are a murderer. How many of us have had anger in our hearts about someone else who got something that, that we thought we should have? Anger is equates to murder under the new covenant. Because what happens is when we carry that jealousy and that anger and that bitterness in our heart, we begin to speak words out of what's in our heart. We begin to speak words. Well, do you know what they did? Did you hear what Pastor Fassel did? I can't believe that. Blah, blah, blah. What are we doing? We are releasing powered by the spirit of jealousy. We are releasing a weapon out of our mouth that will find its target and kill it and remove it so that we get what we want whatever that selfish desire was in your hearts. This is the thing that is tearing the body of Christ apart right now. We are killing each other, powered by the spirit of jealousy. I wanna tell you, you can see this throughout scripture. I'm just gonna throw out some examples and I'll go and look them up during the week. From the beginning, there's always been jealousy. Cain and Abel, they bring offerings to the Lord. Abel's is accepted. Cain isn't. It says he becomes angry. And God says to him, Cain, if you just repent, you know, you will be accepted. But he says, but, it, you know, evil is crouching at the door. It wants to own you. What's crouching? It's that jealousy that wants to come in and, and, and use you to kill your brother. And we know what happened. Cain doesn't repent. He gives in to the anger and he kills his brother. That's jealousy. We saw it with Esau and Jacob. When Jacob, you know, gets the blessing, it says that Esau was jealous of Jacob and then he wants to kill him. Jealousy will always lead to murder. That's why we have to deal with jealousy in our lives. Genesis 26, 14, it says that Isaac sowed during a famine and he reaped a hundredfold. And it says that Isaac became rich. He was blessed during a famine because he did what God said. But it says the Philistines were envious of him. And they went and they filled up the, well, the wells that had been dug by Abraham. They filled them up with sand because they were jealous. When you get blessed by the Lord, others will become so angry. They're going to go stop up your well. They're going to shut down your opportunities. They're going to do what they can to stop the blessing in your life. Jealousy will always try to kill what God is doing. Genesis 37, you can read from verse 11, the story of Joseph. Remember, Joseph comes and he tells his dreams to his brothers, you know, and you're going to bow down, everyone's going to bow down. And it says in verse uh, 11, it says that they envied him. Joseph's brothers envied him and they were jealous of him. And you just read down a few verses to verse 18 and the next thing, they're conspiring to kill him. Jealousy and envy will always lead to murder. We even see this. Think about Saul and David. Saul, Saul was the king. He had his issues and all that kind of thing, but he was the king. And he has David come, and David's part of his army. But then one day, they come back into the city after a war, and everybody's singing, you know, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. Well, immediately, what happens to Saul? He's filled with jealousy. Verse 8. Let's read it. Verse 8. It's 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 8. <clears throat> then Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands. And to me, they've ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? Let's continue. So Saul eyed David from that day forward. And in some translations, it said he eyed him with a jealous eye from that day forward, which means that that spirit of 
jealousy had got on Saul and everything David did, he watched him because he was jealous of him. And he was looking at him all the time thinking, this guy's just trying to steal from me. This one wants to take the kingdom from me. He, he's just looking and thinking like that all the time. And then we see a, a spirit comes upon him and he tries to kill, kill David. In fact, he spends the next number of years of his life trying to kill David because jealousy will always result in murder if we don't repent of it and we don't stop it. And I want to even say to us, it's not just in the Old Testament. It happened in the New Testament. Paul, one of the apostles of the New Testament. Let's go quickly. Acts 13 and verse 45. Paul and Barnabas are on their first missionary journey. They're in Antioch of Pisidia and they're, you know, they're, they're preaching. And then it says, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. So can you see when Paul is now the, the, the guy and all the, you know, everybody's going to Paul's church. Everybody's arriving to hear Paul. The, the Jews are now jealous of Paul. And they're contradicting him, blaspheming him. And if you go down to verse 50, let's go down to verse 50, Acts 13, verse 50. <clears throat> it says, but the Jews, so now what they do, but the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent woman and the chief men of the city. They raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. You see, that spirit when envy and jealousy comes against somebody, they will stir up people against you. They will go and get people of means and people of influence to stir you up, to run you out of town. They want to shut you down. They want to take your voice. They want to make sure you never fulfill the thing God put on the inside of you. Envy and jealousy always seeks to kill you. And let us never forget that Matthew 27, 18 tells us that it was because of envy that they wanted to crucify Jesus. The Pharisees envied Jesus. They envied the power, the authority, everything he had. And because of that, they crucified him. Jealousy and envy will always lead to murder. This is why we as believers, we have to now begin to say, Lord, we want to identify any place where this could be in our hearts because I don't want this thing, this tree of bitterness to grow up. I don't want demons of jealousy and envy and competition and hatred and anger and every other evil thing to be able to breed in my heart because I don't want to be used by the enemy to bring death to the things that God is doing, not in the life of another person and not in the kingdom. And I want to just say this to us. You can become the object of a person's jealousy. You know, like David or Paul, they were just serving the Lord. They were doing what they were called to do. They loved God. They were moving forward, just doing what they were called to do. But the very nature of how God was using them stirred up jealousy against them. And oftentimes, you don't even know when people are jealous of you. You don't even know that you've done anything wrong because you haven't done anything wrong. But those spirits have caused people to target you and you become the object of jealousy. And suddenly you have all this warfare against you. You have spears coming at you left and right, you know, and you're going, what the heck is going on? Doors that were open are suddenly closing. There's confusion and chaos. And you're saying, Lord, where did I miss you? What happened? It's not so much that you missed God, but you are the object of someone's jealousy. Now, that's a whole subject that we want, we are going to deal with. And I wanted to let you know that we are going to deal with that next week in part two of this, because it's very important in the body of Christ. There will always be the spirit of envy and jealousy, but we have to know how to recognize it, how to deal with it and how to protect ourselves from it. And we're going to be looking at that next week. But before we can do that, we have to start with our hearts. We have to start with where we are. We have to be able to come before the Lord and say, Lord, I want to deal with me. I don't want, Lord, any envy, bitterness, self-seeking, competition. Lord, I don't want that in my heart. And Lord Jesus, I need you to show me if it is there. Because, Lord, I, 
don't want it. I don't want it. Because guys, I want us to realize this is unfortunately in our hearts. I think we think too highly of ourselves if we say, oh no, this is not me. I, I don't struggle with this. Because all through scripture, all through scripture, we see people struggling with this. I think Jesus was the only one who didn't. We see this all through scripture. And so we have to be able to be honest with ourselves and with each other and say, Lord, we, 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 we want to deal with this if this is there. Because this divided heart, it cannot continue. Let's just go back to James chapter 4 because James, James knows this. He's explaining it to us. And he's saying these things happen and they land up in our hearts. Why? He said, let me give you the diagnosis. And Pastor Andy preached on this a few weeks ago. James 4, James chapter 4, verse 4 in the Passion Translation. It says, all of these things that we've just explained, they happen because don't you know that flirting with the world's values places you at odds with God? Whoever chooses to be the world's friend makes himself God's enemy. Let's continue. Does the scripture mean nothing to you that says the spirit that God breathed into our hearts is a jealous lover who intensely desires to have more and more of us? This is the diagnosis right here, guys. This is the problem. This is where it all starts, is when we enter into spiritual adultery with the world, when we begin to have a desire that comes from the world and not from God. This is where it all starts. And so we want our hearts to be separated from that spirit of the world. We want our hearts to be wholly given over to the Spirit of God. We don't want any corrupt desire from the world. And this is where the rubber hits the road. If we're going to deal with envy and jealousy, we have to be able to open up our hearts and say, Holy Spirit, you are the jealous lover. Come, Spirit of holiness, and separate us from the Spirit of the world. We want to leave behind. We do not want to be seduced by it. And we do not want to have an affair with the spirit of the world. And you see, James, if we continue reading in James uh, James 4, if we read the verse after, I believe verse 5 or 6, James then tells us, he says, but he continues to pour out more and more grace upon us. Let's just stop there. Because he knows Jesus knows our frail nature. He knows our humanness. He knows the struggle we have. We're constantly flirting with the world. The world's always catching our attention. And he knows we want to serve him, but sometimes we fall in this way. And he says, because of that, he says, I want to pour, I will pour out more and more grace to you. I know how difficult it is. And I don't want you to move in that. I don't want you to get into envy, jealousy. So I'm going to pour out more grace. But here's what you have to do. For it says, God resists you when you are proud, but continually pours out grace when you are humble. Let's read on. So then surrender to God, stand up to the devil and resist him and he will turn and run away from you. Move your heart closer and closer to God and he will come even closer to you. But make sure you cleanse your life, you sinners. Keep your heart pure and stop doubting. Feel the pain of your sin. Be sorrowful and weep. Let your joking around be turned into mourning and your joy into deep humiliation. Be willing to be made low before the Lord and he will exalt you. You see, James is telling us, here's how you deal with it. God God is there to help us and pour out grace upon us. But we have to humble ourselves which means we can't be proud and say, oh no, this is not me. This is for this one and that one. And I'm sure this person over here, I really should just be sending them this message right now because this person needs to hear this message. No, don't do that. We need to hear this message. We need to humble ourselves before God and say, God, I need this. I need you to come and shine the light of your word in my heart, into the crevices of my heart, where there might even be seeds of bitterness, no matter what stage this may be in in my heart, come and shine in my heart. I'm gonna humble myself because Lord, I don't want to kill anybody. And Lord, where I have, I wanna repent. 
And Lord, where my heart is divided and disloyal to you, I want to turn away from it. And I want to say, Lord, I'm yours completely. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to be serious about this. I'm not just going to say, oh, that was good and joke about it. I'm going to be serious. I'm going to humble myself because then God exalts you in due course. And I want to take some time for us to pray tonight. But before I do that, uh, Pastor Fassel, why don't you come back up here and join me? I, I don't know. You, I'm sure you have some comments that you want to make. You know, the world teaches us, Bev, to have selfish ambition, right? You said that human wisdom is that we're supposed to fight for and achieve success, so to speak, which is totally contrary to the kingdom of God, where it all begins, the world's concept is you desire something, go for it, right? And they reward it and pat you on the back. We're constantly surrounded with this form of, of pulling. And we have to really make a choice in our lives where we really um, pursue God and his kingdom and his ways are completely different. So we gotta deal with what's happening in our hearts why we want what we want. And I love what you read in James 4, 5, where the Holy Spirit's basically wanting more and more of us. What does that mean? His real issue with the spirit of the world or our affair is really with selfish ambition. Our affair is with desire for position or power, whether it's in the church or outside of the church or in the world, wherever it might be. Those are the things that are not the Holy Spirit's way. He's all powerful. He, he doesn't think that way. Jesus' way was to walk into a room and take the lower seat at the table, sit in the back. Don't try to take the head table seat. Like, it's the complete opposite way of God. That's the nature of character of Jesus. And so we have to confront what's going on in our hearts and be in a posture to say that's not the way of the kingdom. Because if you want position and you want power, then you're having an affair with that spirit of selfish ambition and envy and that intention and motives. So really committing adultery on the Holy Spirit, having an affair with the world, quite conclusively has to do with flirting with these desires to gain these things the world's way. And I love the way you gave us context today, Beverly. You really gave us context right down to James 4, 7. Now resist the devil. Well, how do you know what to resist until you know what's happening in your heart and until you know what's really driving you in James 3? And then, guys, the warning here of how demonic wisdom looks for a way to cooperate with human desire in wisdom. Human, human wisdom and demonic wisdom is looking for entry point where it turns or like, takes your offense, your pain, your hurt, uh, and then the enemy says, now let's use this to speak against others and in essence make you a weapon of Satan uh, to be used as an instrument of murder to steal and to kill and destroy something that God is doing. Jesus says Satan comes to steal, to kill and destroy. Well now we know how he does it. Come on now. And this is why this is very serious Bev uh, for me as I'm hearing you say this. And uh, so, yes, we, we do need ministry in this area as a family all over the world. And I know this message is not just for us, and it does apply to the body of Christ as a whole. Yeah. But let's at least take responsibility for our house and our family uh, today where um, the Holy Spirit can minister this grace that you referred to, Beverly, that James referred to. Yeah. There is grace available to deal with motivations, the why you want what you want, uh, and, and even prayer life in James that you said, Beverly, that we say, well, it starts with we're, we're not secure enough to believe that the Father is going to provide every good and perfect gift. And whatever belongs to us, no one can steal from us. Then God will bring it into our life. Are we going to trust God for the desires that he's putting in our heart? You know what I'm saying? It really comes down to what's the security. Is the security really in the Father or is it in some other system, or some other person, and so forth and so on? There's that element too, Beverly, that we, we, we should address in our ministry time here for us. Uh, is what's happening? Are we secure in the Father to know Dad's got this for us? You are a son in the kingdom. 
God's grace is available to you and I. That every good and perfect gift comes from Him. And if you don't have something that you desire, well, the Father is your means, not another person, not manipulating or competing with or scheming. Because once envy gets a hold of you, it blinds you. And you don't see what you're doing. And, um, and so, Bev, there's that element too where the enemy then starts to use that person potentially. And I know many of us have prayed so much to God over the years and said, God, have you ever prayed, God, use me? Has anyone ever prayed that prayer? Just raise your hand. Be, be, God, use me. And I'm sure no one has ever said, God, I want Satan to use me. I don't think that's what you meant when you said, God, use me. But how does the enemy use God's people? He uses it the way you explained, Beverly. And it really gave us context today. How many of you got context to, to what's happening here in James 3 and James 4? And this basically tells us all the conflict in the world. What's happening in Russia? What's happening in Ukraine? What's happening in the political world? What's happening in governments? What's happening in, you know, it tells us everywhere. But it starts with us. And in our family at CLM, and our family in Plumline, we don't want the root of bitterness to grow and, and have fruit of that poisonous tree in the form of jealousy, competition, comparison, scheming, envy, and literally hate come in and hurt other people. We don't want to be part of that. Would you agree? We would like to have a genuine move of the Holy Spirit. And I believe the Holy Spirit wants that. And He is so in love with us. He so wants to release His grace that He's willing to speak truth to us so clearly today to say, hey, I don't want to be part of the enemy's plan. I want to be part of God's. And then I love the second part of this message, which, which is so important how next week we're going to go into how to deal with when jealousy is a weapon that Satan's using to attack your life, maybe your destiny. Maybe what's holding back something in your life is actually the assignment of jealousy against you. But in reality, we, we have no authority to address that until we deal with what may be happening in our own hearts. If we're part of this thing, then how do we take authority over this thing that might be opposing us? You see what I'm saying? So we want to go there. And, and in, in many ways, that's a bit more uh, exciting because you get to experience the freedom and the deliverance of this assignment against you breaking, right? So today it's more the heart surgery part, right? That's a bit like, whoa. But I'm so grateful, Beverly, you went down this road. And I really sense this is extremely significant for us as a church family, as a leadership network around the world. Come on, leaders, you know what we're talking about. This is key. And um, whatever the Father has for us, God wants us to know that that is available to us. He has it for us. So back to you, Beverly, here. Let's begin to minister here to them. Any other thoughts, Beverly, that you have? What are you sensing here as we're talking about this? Just the main thing is, it's, I want to follow on what you just said. The Holy Spirit is so jealous for our hearts. And, and he's, he's allowed us to hear this message tonight because he's so jealous for our hearts. He wants more and more of us. That doesn't mean that our hearts are far from the Lord. He's coming close to us because he's saying, I want more. I, 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 I've heard your prayers that you want more of me. So I'm coming close and I'm bringing truth to you so that I can have more of you. He, which is so exciting to me that, that he's doing this. Do you know what I'm saying? It's hard to to acknowledge some of these things but how incredible that holy spirit he's looking at us and he's saying i love you so much i want more of you i'm not going to allow any little piece of your heart to be taken or seduced by the world we're going to deal with that so i can have all of you because i'm so jealous for you how incredible the love of jesus for us i think that's what's just coming through to me mostly as you're talking yeah i love that bev so let's do that, church family. Let's get into a posture of heart um, to respond to this word on a personal level right now. Uh, and then also we can respond on, a, on a, a collective level as a family around the world. But let's start with our hearts. And, 
and, and really look into your heart. And oftentimes, I love what you said, Bev, that sometimes we desire spiritual things, although desiring spiritual things is a good thing. But when the motive is wrong and the way you go about it, for example, James says, you know, you don't ask and you don't receive. So right there, if you stop, you think, well, actually, I didn't trust God. That's step one. But he says, but then you do ask. Oh, okay. But you did deal with your heart. You're asking with ill motives. So you're praying maybe for position, praying to be used in ministry, or praying to have a position at your workplace, and you're praying and praying and praying and praying, and, and you think that you're really being godly about it. And what you're really doing is he says, you're only praying amiss, meaning it's useless because the motivation of why you want that position at work or why you want that house or why you want to be speaking on stage or why you want to be singing and, you know, whatever on stage or, or why you want to be the one who's invited on television or, you know, you know what I'm saying? People go to Bible school and they get this way. They come out of Bible school and every single one of them I met from certain Bible schools, they all have the same thing. God's called them to have 10,000 people in their church, have a television program and have multiple books and have this and have that and have that. I'm like, what Bible school did you go to? Because every calling is unique. Every gift is unique. And God is a diverse God. You, you know what I'm saying? So the reason I brought that out again, Bev, because oftentimes we can hide behind spiritual things. That's right. It's great to touch many people's lives. Amen? Do you see what I'm saying? But what's the motive? Yeah. And the motive That's should right. be God... Wherever I am, I'm going to be faithful. Use me here. If I'm in prison like Joseph, God help me to minister to the, the prisoners. If, you're, if I'm in this city, if I'm in this... You see what I'm saying? You, if I'm serving in kids' ministry, God, let me serve in kids' ministry. And some people come into church and they have this ambitious attitude. I just want to climb the church ladder too now. There used to be a corporate ladder, but now there's a church ladder. And we're climbing the church ladder. And then, you know, I've already served in all these arenas and now I deserve to be preaching or whatever I need to be doing. Or, Hey, preach the gospel. 7.854 billion people on the planet. At least, you know, almost 5 billion are available. Please. You, you see what I'm saying? So Beverly, and I, and I know we're going to pray here, but I want to bring this about because, you know, there's also spiritual things that we desire sometimes with the wrong motive. If you can pray, which is a spiritual thing, and do it with the wrong motive that God says, I'm sorry, I can't give it to you, then could that be the reason why the breakthrough hasn't been happening for, for, for you or for me or for us or for whatever? And this applies collectively too, where we as a church, if that's our attitude... Then, then we can't move forward in the move of God. If our attitude is that we are better than others, or our attitude is, you know, that, you know, we don't have because some other church has and some other, you know, it doesn't matter. We're called to do what God's called us to do. We each have a metron and a measure, right, Bev? And so I brought that back because part of the Holy Spirit's love for us is not just personal for you, for me, but it's for us collectively. We are the temple and the body of the Holy Spirit, the temple, the dwelling place of God's Spirit. We are the temple of God. And so he wants access to his temple versus Galatians says, we bite one another, we devour one another, and we destroy one another. And so Bev, coming back to what you're saying here, so so as we begin to pray here, let's, let's just get into a posture, guys, of uh, of our hearts being uh, touched by the Holy Spirit. And let's receive this grace, first of all, to even see where the motives are off. Right? Because you don't even know sometimes that you've been... Because I sense this, Bev, as we're talking here, that there are situations where this competition and this jealousy entered in through a hurt, an offense, mm -hmm. or some pain in your life somewhere, even a potential trigger... And then it's so old now that you're not even aware. Like by the time you're being used by the enemy to, to murder and release the spirit of murder like King Saul was releasing the spirit of murder against David. By the time you get there, something happened long ago. You're not aware of it. I don't, I don't believe you're conscious in saying, yes, I'm really doing this. I, at that point, you're so unaware 
of what's taking place because you wouldn't do it. I don't believe you would do it as a believer, right, Pip? You wouldn't do it consciously if you really know Jesus. You wouldn't do it and say, I really, really, really want to do the devil's work. And I want to hurt the bride that Jesus died for and hurt the church that he is cleansing and washing and presenting as a glorious church, the one whom he shed his blood for, the church who is his bride and who covers a multitude of sin. This Jesus did all this and said, this is my bride. And then he challenges husbands to love their wives in the same way. It's, I don't believe a true believer, Bev, would do this consciously. So something has occurred in their heart long ago where they let this thing slide. Now it got to the place of, hey, I'm justified in my reasoning. You know, justification is a satanic weapon that is used often by people. If you are justified in any way, shape, or form outside of the sacrifice of Jesus, it is demonic. And Satan uses justification. I'm justified now to say this about that person or speak about that person. Maybe I'm hurting, maybe I'm venting. Whatever your justification is, the enemy looks for those type of entry points. And so Bev, you know, we're, just, we're just making a plane. We're gonna receive communion here. Yeah. And I think we should prepare the elements of communion too in just a moment, but let's pray right now. Because when we receive communion, we're heading into this place of grace, heading into this place of the blood. Uh, and, and, and the sacrifice of Jesus as we do that. But let's, let's pray here, Bev. Is there, do you want to start praying? or Do you want to lead us in a prayer? Or how do you want to do this? Yeah, I'll start and then you can jump in <clears throat> if you lose me or if I, if I lose, oh. if I, you know, you can just add in what you, what you need to add. Thank you, Father. <sighs> Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. But even as we begin to pray right now, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here with us. Yeah. And we thank you for your word that has come to us to speak to us, to divide between soul and spirit, between to divide between the thoughts and intentions of our heart. We thank you for your word today. And we want to begin today, Lord, we want to humble ourselves before you. We want to humble ourselves, Father. We want to make ourselves low before you because we need you. Lord, we need you. We don't even know where some of this is in our hearts, Father. And so we want to say, we're any, we're, because we don't even know where this came in. Lord, whether it was through a wounding, whether it was, a, whatever it was, we don't even know. And so right now, Holy Spirit, we want to open up our hearts to you. And we want to ask, Holy Spirit, that you would shine in our hearts, that the word would shine in our hearts and even speak to us right now. Any place where there is a seed of bitterness towards you, God. Lord, where we have felt that you've kept things back from us. Lord, would you show us that in our hearts right now? Would you show us where there are places where we are um, comparing ourselves to, other, to others or where we are coveting or wanting things that others have? Holy Spirit, we need you to show us. We don't even know where we are looking at these things with corrupt desires and motives. So we need you. And I want to say we trust you right now, Holy Spirit, that you would cause us to see, cause us to remember now, show us our own hearts, Holy Spirit. because we choose to turn away from the sin. Lord, we don't want, we don't want corrupt motives. I, I just want us to take a moment because I can sense the Holy Spirit moving in hearts. I'm just gonna wait a moment here because Holy Spirit is bringing to your remembrance things that have happened or he's showing you certain things, bringing conversations to mind because he's bringing light 
to the places where these things have been hidden in our hearts. And Holy Spirit, as you're doing this, we just ask you for grace. We choose to turn away from these sins as you are unveiling them to us, as we're seeing where we have been jealous, where we have been envious, where we have uh, done things out of a wrong motive, as, as, that, as that light is coming to us, as that conviction is coming to us, you know, from our conscience and, and through the Holy Spirit. We respond to you, Holy Spirit. And we say, we don't want to walk in these things anymore. We choose to resist them. We don't want to walk in these things. We don't want to, we don't want to uh, work with spirits of jealousy and envy. We turn our back on those things. We repent of them. We say, we are so sorry. We did not know that. We didn't know that. Forgive us. Forgive us. Forgive us for our bitterness. Forgive us for our anger, our resentment. Forgive me for comparing myself to others, God, and thinking that you kept things back for me. Forgive me for being envious of what others have, envious of their ministry, envious of the things they hear from God, envious of the relationships that they have envious of the the job they have the position they have lord forgive me have mercy on me lord have mercy on us we want to draw close to you now we want to draw close to you and we because we're asking that you would forgive us that you would cleanse us by the blood of the lamb that as we humble ourselves and as we turn from these wicked ways, that you would cleanse us by your blood, that the blood would begin to wash over our hearts, that the blood would begin to wash through the crevices in our hearts where these things have hidden away, where these things have, have, have put themselves into hiding places in our hearts. We thank you now, Lord, let the blood begin to flow over these things. And Lord, I pray that even as Holy Spirit is, is opening up and doing heart surgery on us, if there is any place in us where we have not trusted the Father, where we have doubted His goodness, where we have believed the lie of the enemy that God would want to keep things from us, Lord, forgive us today and heal us, heal our hearts today. Come Holy Spirit and do what you do. You said through your word that you pour out more grace upon us. And so I am asking today for more grace. I'm asking for more grace, more grace, more grace upon us. Lord, I want to thank you that at your table is where we find grace. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. I, I don't know, I don't know, Pastor Fassel, if you want to pray anything else specific, but before we turn, before we come to the table together. You know, Bev, even as we come to the table, the part that keeps coming up in my heart is as a family, we're a family around the world, and maybe we've been part of um, the tree of bitterness in some way. Maybe you've eaten some fruit of someone else's pain or bitterness. Maybe you have eaten of the fruit of someone else's offense or strife. Or maybe you're someone that passed that on in some way because of your own pain. Now we receive forgiveness. But I think collectively as a church, 
we want to um, deny the right for the spirit of bitterness to exist in our midst as a family. And I feel we've come to a place as we receive communion, Bev, as we've dealt with our hearts personally, that collectively we need to make a choice and, and untie ourselves from the residue or the fruit of the poisonous tree. It's a legal term, actually, that evidence is inadmissible in a court of law if you find it rooted and obtained incorrectly or defiled to begin with. And it's called the fruit of the root of the poisonous tree. So if they find the poisonous tree, then anything connected to that tree is no longer usable against you by the enemy, so to speak. And so I believe we can stand as a church family around the world that as God has identified to us how bitterness can grow like a tree or jealousy or envy can become a tree, right, Bev? That's what you talked about. Then, then would it be okay that before we receive communion and as we receive communion to collectively renounce any allegiance, alliance to the tree of envy, jealousy, and bitterness, which is really the same thing? What do you think, Bev, if we do that right now? Yeah, I think that would be really good. Okay, so let's do that uh, right now. And I, I want you to kind of repeat after me because we're going to do this collectively as a family around the world. This is not just, do you know what I'm saying? We've come to the throne. We receive forgiveness. Holy Spirit is showing us motives in areas of our life that we are pursuing in His grace uh, to now change the way we think inside. But now collectively, what about our family? What if we've been eating a fruit that we don't know that was connected to a poisonous root somewhere. Hello? What if we're carrying an offense from our past about another church, another ministry, another leader? Are you with me? Because we heard somebody say something about someone and now, you know what I mean, we're carrying that forward and now we're using that to project on our brother and sister next to us or our family around us, right? Do you know what I'm saying? That's how projection works. It's a psychological term. We take a offense of someone else's or ours and we see that lens and we view things through that lens and we tr treat other people out of that as if they are the ones that hurt us. Well, no, we want the opposite. We want love for one another, right? We want acceptance for one another. We want grace for one another. Would you agree? That's how we deal with it. Many of us have been through tough times, but we have to come to a place but we don't carry and eat of that fruit. Maybe you're eating of the fruit of justification, that I'm justified to speak like that. Or, you know, you're eating of the fruit of jealousy. You know where I'm going with this. Can we uproot this tree today? Yes. Would you have the faith and the courage to say, no, we want to uproot this thing. So let's just repeat after me. Say, Father, we come to you afresh in the name of Jesus. And at your throne of grace today, we have received mercy. And we receive grace in this our time of need to heal our hearts, to cleanse our hearts from wrong motives, from envy, from competition, and from jealousy. But now, Lord, anywhere we have aligned with, knowingly or unknowingly, with the root of bitterness or jealousy on a collective level, on a corporate level, as a family, anywhere we've allowed the tree of bitterness or the root of bitterness to access our lives, whether it's through words, conversations, prayers, anything that has been an alliance with or rooted in the spirit of jealousy, we desire to sever all ties with it in Jesus' name. So say today, we sever we divorce the spirit of jealousy personally and collectively as a church around the world. And we deny the right for the root of bitterness or the tree of bitterness or the tree of jealousy to exist in our midst. We sever all ties to that root system, to that fruit system. And anywhere we have developed an appetite for that kind of food, we ask you to change our palate for food that comes from heaven, fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we sever 
we cancel, we divorce all allegiance, all alliance to the spirit of jealousy and its tree in our midst. And today, we say, Father, uproot the tree of bitterness. Any root that is historical, whether we know of it or whether we don't, today, we ask it to be uprooted by the sovereign hand of God and by your spirit. And Lord, we ask that your life flows now into every area of this church. Anywhere this spirit infiltrated the house, in the name of Jesus, we call it exposed, brought to light, void of power, and ineffective in Jesus' name. And we cancel this demonic strategy in Jesus' name. And we choose to eat of the tree of life. Not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but the tree of life. And Jesus, you came to give us life and life more abundantly. And we thank you for that right now. In Jesus' name. Bev, are you sensing anything more? Or seeing anything? No, I'm just, as you are praying, I, I, family, we need to understand how significant this is because what I'm seeing, Pastor Fassel, is as you're praying, you know, that tree's being up, uprooted, but it's like I see the season changing. Even as you're as the tree's being uprooted, it's like something that was gray is, is now coming into full color. I, I can see a shift and a turning. So it's extremely significant what you're doing. It's shifting the spiritual atmosphere in our house and in our family. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, church, we really need to run with this. Something has shifted for us, and, um, you know, this is how the enemy strategy just got exposed. And God has uprooted something. He's literally uprooted something out of our midst, baby. He's just uprooted the whole thing. It's gone. That's right. We, we don't need that in our midst, right? Well, are we ready now? Now we can pass out communion. Sorry, guys, I know you got going there, but we didn't want to interrupt the prayer. I know, family, we've gone much longer than we ever go on a Sunday morning. But it was important that we take the time to deal with this root and this tree on a personal and collective level. Amen. Father, we give you all the glory right now. God, as we're getting ready to uh, remember Jesus and what he accomplished for us today, we're so grateful. You know, Bev said to me last night, gratitude is one of the key things that will protect our hearts. Gratitude for how good God is to us and what he has entrusted us with and what he has given us and what we do have in him. That gratitude is so awesome. God, we are so thankful. We are so thankful for your goodness today. And God, we just thank you for what Jesus did for us on the cross. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful to you that you, as the living word, came to earth. You were born of a virgin. You died on the cross. You became sin. You took our old nature. You became it on the cross. You took the wrath of God. You were striped for our healing. You were crowned for our glory. You were humiliated and mocked and ridiculed for our honor. And you took our sickness, our sorrow, our pain. You know, folks, there's something happening here. I mean, healing takes place when we realize what Jesus actually did. And this root of bitterness thing, it's gotten pulled out. And I just sense healing is going to just be released over us. Just the healing power of God ministering into our, our bodies and into our, our souls and emotions even. Lord, we just thank you today that Jesus, you were wounded for our transgressions. You were bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was placed upon you and by your stripes and scourging we are healed. Peter said we were healed at the cross. Therefore, we are healed today. And Lord, we thank you today as we forgive others. 
as we examine our own hearts and we forgive others. Come on, forgive others. Lord, we thank you today that this tree of jealousy and bitterness and envy is rooted out from amongst us and there's a peace and a divine protection around us. And we thank you, the tree of life, who is Jesus, is in our midst. And we are branches of the true vine where the life of God flows in our midst. And we thank you for being a life-giving body. And we ask today, Father, anything that has been held up that you desire to release in our lives that was held up because of this, we ask now that you begin to release the blessing and release the grace. Release the presence of God in our midst. And Lord Jesus, we remember you as we receive this, your body that was broken for us. Let's receive this together. And now, this beautiful blood of Jesus that was shed for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you that your blood was shed. Heavenly blood, holy blood, pure blood. We're so grateful that this blood not only cleanses us from sin, but heals us and delivers us. And we thank you. It is the new covenant in your blood that every covenant promise is yes and amen. Let's receive this together. Amen, amen, amen. Now, I know we've gone a little bit over time here, um, but we want to quickly give you an opportunity as we close to become part of the church family. If you're here, we do this randomly, usually on the first Sunday of the month, or whatever time to do it, May 1st. If you'd like to become part of this family, and you're like, hey, this is my family. This is the church family I want to be part of. I'm called here. I want to learn here. I want to grow here. I want to be taught and fed the word here. And I want to mature here. Me and my family. If that's you online or you're here in person today, we want to give you the opportunity to say, I want to become part of this family. If you come to the front, we'll personally pray for you and bless you and publicly honor you. If you've never experienced that in our life, it's powerful. If you become part of this family and you never got a chance to have that happen to you for some reason, that you were out of town when we did that, then you can come forward as well. So if anybody would like to become part of the church family, we want to give you a quick invitation to come up forward, and we can quickly pray for you. Is there anybody like that? Would you, would you just come forward? I can't really see out in the, in, in the lights out there. Let's give this person a hand that's coming forward here. God bless you. Come on over. Just come stand here and just face me there. Anybody else coming? Is there someone else coming here? Just come and stand here. If there, I think there's another lady coming. God bless you. Can we give her a hand as she comes up? Wants to become part of the family right here as well. Thank you for coming forward. Just come in. Just stand here and just face me. We're going to pray for you here in just a moment. I think another gentleman's coming over here. God bless you. Come on forward here. Come into the house online. They're putting your names up there. Just let us know online on, on social media. You can comment on Facebook or on YouTube. Or you can email church at Covenant of Life. And we're going to receive you publicly as well. I'm going to have Pastor Dennis come up and, and help me, if you don't mind, over here. Let's start with uh, this lady over here. Uh, God bless you. What's your name? Ashley. Ashley. And um, we want to receive you into the house, and we want to bless and honor you. Is that okay if we yep. kind of lay hands on you? That's a symbol of blessing. And I want to extend those of you in the audience. Would you extend your heart uh, towards Ashley over here? And we want to pray for her right now as well. Let's do that. Father, we just thank you for Ashley today. And God, we thank you for your precious blood that was shed for her on Calvary. And we declare the blood of Jesus is holy and powerful and matchless in all its ways. And Lord, we cancel every assignment of the enemy against Ashley's life. And we speak peace over her mind, her health, her emotions, and her future. And we declare that she's a daughter and she is so loved by you. Ashley, God has not forgotten about you. I hear Jeremiah 29, I think it's 11. For God says, I know the plans I have for you and the thoughts I think towards you. Plans of peace and not evil to give you hope in the future. God only thinks good thoughts. Any thought that claims to be a thought from God that is not good then you know it's not actually from God. 
God is not condemning you. God is not mad at you. God is not upset with you. God loves you. You are loved by him immensely. And today we just pray honor over you where you have been dishonored, where you've been humiliated. We pray honor over you and grace over you and covering over you and protection over you today. And we declare you a daughter of God. We bless you today in Jesus' name. Stay here, Ashley, for just a moment, okay? My dear, what's your name? Diana. Diana. All right, well, we, can we pray for you and receive you? Are you from locally? Where are you from? What city? Township of Langley. Township of Langley. Well, we receive people from the township, do we? <laughs> so let's pray for uh, Diana right now and just pray a blessing over her. Father, we just thank you for Diana, your daughter, today. And Father, we just thank you for the hand of the Lord rest upon her. We thank you for your blessing rests upon her. I just saw this um, spout open up over you of, of just like the flow of, of God's river and water, like, like the glory spout. You just walked up under the glory spout. And God, I just thank you. The presence of God is going to intensify in Diana's life. I thank you that you're going to have her experience the desires of her heart for you in this season. And I just thank you, Father, that she's going to be rooted and grounded and planted and grow in the house of God. Even in these latter years of her life, she's going to see more growth, more excitement in the things of God than she's seen in her entire life. And she's seen some things, Lord. She's tasted some things. But by comparison, that was a taste to what you're going to do. And so, God, we pray blessing upon her, Diana, covering upon her, grace upon her, and honor over her. And I hear Psalm 91, 16 over you, Diana. It says, with long life, you will satisfy me, and you will show me my salvation. Jesus said, you will show him my salvation. God wants you to continue to experience the beauty of salvation, from the joy of salvation, to the deliverance of salvation, to the abundance of salvation, to the flow of salvation in every area of your life. And anywhere the enemy has stolen from you, robbed of you, and, and, and you feel like it's, 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 it was stolen, it's gone. God wants to say he's restoring and he's bringing salvation and restoring the joy of your salvation and it's for your life. Now, do you have any children or grandchildren? Or anything? I really feel it for them. For Eric and Jake. Pardon me? Eric and Jake. Jake. Well, we pray for Eric and Jake and I just sense God that the, anything the enemy stole from this woman's lineage and heritage of her children and grandchildren you're restoring that to them now in jesus name and we declare every demonic plan is canceled and your plans will be established in her life in their life in jesus name amen can we agree yeah. just stay up here dan you're welcome you received that that's awesome my brother what's your name jose jose well, that's a good name <laughs> and and where where are you from are you for local or Abbotsford. Abbotsford. Well, do we welcome people from Abbotsford? We do, right? I want to pray for you, Jose, and welcome you to the house. And so, do, do you have family here in Abbotsford? Yeah. Okay. And t tell us about your family here. Um, my wife, and we got five children. Wow. Yeah, my mom's out here, my dad's out here. As well. well, you got a lot of family. Siblings, yeah. Siblings, too. Well, that's great. So, you guys have been here a long time in the Lower Mainland then? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let's pray for Jose right now and uh, pray blessing upon him. Lord, we just thank you for my brother over here. We just want to honor you today, Jose. We thank you for your family, your wife, your five children, your siblings. And God, I just thank you that this entire family would begin to experience the grace of God in an unusual and uncommon way. We declare honor where there's been dishonor. We declare restoration where there's been theft. And we declare the blessing of the Lord to begin to function in a measure that Jose has never known. And God, we just pray protection over him, grace over him, Hasid, which is kindness towards him, and his family, and his children, Lord. Father, I declare his seed's going to possess the gates of the enemy in this generation. And we declare blessing upon his children, upon his wife and his family today, and upon him in Jesus' name. Bless you. Jose, I don't know what you do for a living, but I really sense God wants to increase your provision in your life, meaning like uh, financial flow into your home and into your family. So, uh, you know, are you okay with that? 
Are you okay with that? So, Lord, we just pray blessing over Jose financially in every area of his life and prosper him and bless him as well in Jesus' name. Amen. See, God cares about every little thing. What's your name? Aiden. Aiden. Oh, we know Aiden, don't we? You know me. I do. And so, how many know Aiden over here? few of you. Okay. We're going to pray for Aiden and receive, receive you into the house. Tell them a little bit about who you're connected with here so they understand. I am the son of Ray Samuel. Where's Ray? Wave your hand. So I heard you were in Mexico for a while. Yeah, five months. Five months. How was that? Pretty good. Did you enjoy the beach and the, and the water? And yeah, yeah. Yeah, you did. How is it coming back to Canada now? Cold. Cold? <laughs> I like it though. Do you too like hot, too hot in Mexico? Too hot right now in Mexico, yeah. yeah. Well, welcome back. Thank you. Let's pray for Aiden right now. We just want to bless you and receive you into the house. Father, we just thank you for Aiden as he comes into the house today. God, we want to honor him today. We want to decree blessing over him today. And Father, we just thank you that he's your son. And Father, even as we're praying over him, we just pray grace and blessing to come upon Ray and the family, uh, upon his brother even, upon Penny and his siblings. And Father, I just thank you right now that the blessing comes upon this entire family and grace comes on the family. Even as Aiden comes here and becomes part of the house, I just declare grace and blessing in every area of their home and every demonic agenda against him and his future is canceled exposed and brought to light and I declare blessing upon Aiden I thank you for his future father and I'm hearing the same verse I heard over somebody earlier today Jeremiah 29 11. God says I know the plans I have for you Aiden these plans are good and my thoughts towards you are good they are not evil and it's to give you peace and hope and our prosperous future. Different translations put it together like that. So God's only got good plans for you. So any plans that are fearful or threatening to you or accusatory towards you or any type of evil intent, you know right away that's not God. So whatever's going on in your life, whatever you might be struggling with or facing, whatever it might be, that spirit is not of God. God's plan is He's got a future for you. He's not giving up on you. And he's going to think only good thoughts. God's not thinking bad thoughts about Aiden. So you almost want to anchor that in your soul and be like, well, I know that's not a God thought. So if it's not a God thought, I'm not accepting it. Does that, does that make sense? Because God thinks of Aiden only good thoughts, not evil thoughts. And so we don't want those thoughts being fired. And the enemy can fire thoughts into our mind. Sometimes we can put thoughts in our own mind too, right? We're just down or whatever the case is but we want to re-come back into that place of what God's thinking about you so if you keep thinking about what God thinks about you Adrian how old are you now 21 you're 21 you you got a you, you can you can do a whole lot Aiden. this is a good time for you in your life to uh to, to you know really begin to hear from God and guys become part of our new members uh, time that we get together with Pastor Dennis I encourage you to come out when he gets together for a few weeks here, or someone else on our team will, where we gather as new members as a family, and we get to hang out a little bit and, and learn a little bit about your story, get to meet people, know one another, and just help you grow and make the most of being part of God's family. And we want to help you have that, all right? So please fo follow Pastor Dennis here, and he's going to talk to you for a couple moments here, and then we'll be right back. But can we give them a hand? God bless them. Wow, this is the longest service we have had in history on our Sunday morning experience. We also have Pete from Cornell, British Columbia. Now, Pete, are you in the Cornell campus right now? That'd be really cool if you are. If you're at the campus, um, come up front and let Pastor, Pastors Bruce and Linda and, or Pastors Vic and Diana, somebody receive you and publicly lay hands on you. That'd be really cool if you're physically present there or anybody in Cornell, just walk up front and they'll receive you like that as well. But, or if you're online, Pete, that's okay. I'm, I'm going to pray over you regardless. Can we pray over Pete right now? Father, we just thank you for Pete. And we just thank you, Father, the spirit of honor would come and rest upon him. We pray anywhere he's been dishonored or experienced discouragement in his life. I thank you, Father, that you're encouraging him in this season. God wants you to know, Pete, it's an encouraging season for you. It's a delivering season for you. It's a breakthrough season for you. For even as you've come in the house of God, God has prepared a table before you, Pete, in the presence of your enemies. And the Lord is anointing your head with oil, causing your cup 
to run over into the overflow, and goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. In Jesus' name we pray, and we say amen. Pete, if you're not physically present in the Cornell campus right now, make sure you come there and talk to Pastors Bruce and Linda, or Pastors Vic and Diana, any of them. They're all amazing. Come in there in person since you are located in Cornell. And if you are there, please see them now. I think it would be exciting. Well, wasn't that great to have Beverly share that with us? Wow. Please take the time to deal with any issues that come up and any insights that you get from God. You're going to become more aware now. And then next Sunday, we're going to go down the road of how to deal with the assignment of jealousy uh, opposing your life and your destiny. I think that's important. Uh, we, how are you excited about that? So we're going to go down that road as well. All right, listen, we love you. Uh, once again, uh, apologies for going a little bit over time today, but we love you. We're so grateful. Can't wait what God's going to do this week. And remember, be expectant for what? What God's going to do this week and what he's going to do next time we gather in his house. Would you agree? Can you be expectant?